The Nuremberg Trials, 1945. If Hess is really insane, how can he be tried with his old Nazi colleagues as a war criminal? Confronted with Goering, his former secretaries, some of his oldest friends, most believe him mad. Seven psychiatrists, however, American, British, French, and Russian, conclude Hess has recovered from a true psychotic episode induced by the ignominious failure of his mission. He is unstable, and he has, doctors say, a culturally conditioned pseudo-paranoia, but is legally sane and can be tried. However, the War Crimes Tribunal must decide if Hess's loss of memory will hinder his ability to defend himself. A chief American prosecutor at Nuremberg, Telford Taylor. Uh, one of the lawyers, one of the other lawyers on the staff assisting Justice Jackson was the late uh, John Holland Amon, a prominent uh, uh, New York attorney. Uh, Amon got the idea that he would uh, uh, collect a lot of documentary movies of the Nazi period, movies which showed Hess himself, showed him with Hitler, showed him addressing great uh, party rallies, showed him in all kinds of different situations in the period before he flew to England. Uh, and uh, he would bring in Hess uh, with a lot of people, uh, a lot of witnesses there, and uh, sit Hess down and show him these movies and, uh, and see if that did anything to restore uh, Hess's memory. Well, I'm afraid it didn't work very well. Uh, these movies were very interesting, and uh, Hess watched them with great interest, and uh, at the end of them, uh, John Holland Amon said to him, well, Hess, do, uh, do you remember anything? Hess said no. That was that. Justice Jackson, representing the United States, uh, took this position. Uh, the psychiatrist's report indicated that uh, Hess had refused to allow any uh, narcosis drugs to be administered to him. The psychiatrist had wished uh, to give him various drugs which might either stimulate his memory or enable them to tell better the extent to which he was faking. And Hess had refused to allow these drugs to be administered to him. His uh, uh, amnesia is not of the type that's a complete blotting out of the personality, of the type uh, that uh, uh, is, uh, would be fatal to his defense. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we feel that uh, so long as Hess refuses the ordinary, simple expedience, uh, even if his amnesia is genuine, that he is not in a position to continue to assert that he must not be brought to trial. We think this trial should proceed. Before the tribunal had a chance to come to any conclusion about it, uh, uh, Hess himself said he wanted to be heard. I have gleich zu begin the verhandlung. He said that uh, he had been feigning, uh, pretending his amnesia, uh, and uh, he wished the tribunal now to know that he was in possession of his faculties, uh, that his concentration was a little disturbed, but that he could remember now, and he wished to take his place with his fellow defendants and to be tried. This is granted. Sir Geoffrey Lawrence, tribunal president, asks each defendant for his plea. The defendant to plead guilty or not guilty to the charges against them. Rudolf Hess. Nine. That will be entered as a plea of not guilty. The prosecution presents a chart of the Nazi organization. An American lawyer explains, the Fuhrer is the supreme and only leader in the Nazi hierarchy. And here he makes a slip. He says, his successor designate was first the defendant Hess, and subsequently the defendant Goering. Both Hess and Goering hear this in the German translation. And uh, Goering, as you may know, was a man of a great and enormous vanity. And uh, when he heard this coming over the translation system, that uh, the American lawyer was saying that he was number three and Hess number two, uh, why Goering was immediately uh, uh, very much piqued, and he began waving around and pointing to himself, Ich bin die Zweite. I was the second. And uh, calling everybody's attention to the fact that, that he'd been demoted quite unjustly. Uh, well, uh, while Goering was going through these antics to try to call attention to uh, the true state of uh, affairs, uh, Hess looked over at Goering, who was sitting on his right, and uh, saw what Goering was doing. Then he leaned back and he laughed and laughed and laughed. 
And uh, this led me, at least, to believe that uh, Hess's amnesia was, in part at least, feigned. And I so expressed the opinion then. Hess seems happy. He writes to his wife, dearest little mommy, my comrades recognize with joy I am still exactly the same man. But he has stomach cramps, says his guards are poisoning him. Co-defendant Albert Speer says, in German, what a screwball. During Hess's defense, the Nazis fear he will make fools of them. Goering is mocking. Another one asks, this is what Hitler called a political leader? Walter Funk says, seriously, it is not funny. It is disgraceful. They are especially ashamed of Hess's naive personal offer of peace to Britain, of which he is most proud. Hess asked to make a final statement before the verdict. Einige meiner Kameraden hier können bestätigen, dass ich bereits zu Beginn des A large part of this uh, last statement of his, which uh, was about, oh, 20 minutes long, was very rambling and inarticulate and had to do with uh, uh, how there are a lot of people around him while he was in prison in England who had glassy eyes and stared at him in a strange way. And much of what he said, uh, as I say, is incoherent and, uh, and uh, suggestive of profound abnormality in his mind. Uh, but after the court had said, you've been talking for 20 minutes and uh, time's running out, he then said at the end, uh, I was permitted to work for many years of my life under the greatest son whom my people has brought forth in its thousand year history, meaning Hitler. Even if I could, I would not want to erase this period of time from my existence. I am happy to know that I have done my duty to my people, my duty as a German, as a National Socialist, as a loyal follower of my Fuhrer. I do not regret anything. It is October 1st, 1946, the day of judgment. Hess will leave the court, strut to his cell, laugh, and say he did not hear the verdict and does not care what the sentence will be. Defendant Rudolf Hess, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to imprisonment for life. Hess served that life sentence in Spandau Prison in Germany. His late years clouded in mystery and speculation. There were some who claimed that the mad old man, for years the only Nazi prisoner left in the prison, was not really Hess at all. Some advanced the theory that Hess never made it to England, that an imposter took his place, and that the imposter may have been a Soviet KGB agent attempting to find out whether the British were planning to turn against the Soviet Union in an alliance with the Nazis. The strange case of Rudolf Hess will most likely never be fully explained or understood.